Country Podcast. Hello and welcome, I'm your host Glenn Pringle and this is the Bearbo Archery Podcast. Okay, on the line with me now I've got David Jackson. David's a French Bearbo archer and he's, uh, he's pretty hot with the old Bearbo. Uh, how are you David? I'm good, thank you. How are you, Glenn? Yeah, good, not so bad. I'm, uh, like most people, stuck indoors pretty much um, 90% of the time. So, uh, uh, is that the same for you? Yeah, it's uh, it's been like that in France for two weeks already. It's on complete lockdown, basically. Right. How have you been coping? Uh, I've been doing a lot of archery, shooting a lot of arrows. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I'm lucky to have a small garden. Uh, I can shoot up to 18 meters, so that's pretty cool. Oh yeah, that's great. So David, um, just for the listeners that might not know you, can you just introduce yourself? Uh, just tell us who you are, uh, where you are, and what you do in archery and your archery achievements. Yeah, so um, I live in the south of France, near Toulouse. I'm uh, 27 years old and uh, I have been shooting for 15 years. Uh, I've been doing 10 years of bare bow, uh, doing competitions, and uh, I've been do- uh, shooting uh, in field 3D, indoor and uh, 2D at a national level, and uh, in field and 3D internationally. Uh, so I got my first selection in the French team in uh, 2015, and uh, since then I I got selected uh, seven times. So uh, in 2017, I uh, well, in 2017 uh, th- until now, I have been uh, well. I have reached the 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 top four individually in uh, international tournaments, and I've won a few team medals at uh, both uh, European and field world championships. Uh, so. Um, Three times in a row, I finished at the fourth place in, individually, and uh, eventually uh, last year I I got both uh, world uh, gold medals at the the world championships in uh, 3D in Canada. That's excellent, um, excellent. Top skills, <laughs> top skills there. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, 2015 is that kind of when you burst onto the the, the international scene with regards to field and 3d is that kind of the start of your international journey yeah it was my uh, first selection uh, in the french team and uh, i shot at the european field championships in poland and uh, that's where i got uh, my first medal uh, it was a silver team medal oh cool and for anyone who doesn't um, know you uh, they could go and check out the various youtube feeds for world archery and World Archery Europe, uh, I'll just type in um, one of the one of the ones that's quite easy to find is the Lac La uh, 3D final or the Cortina 3D final. But there's quite a few on there, and people can see you shooting your style, um, you know what you do, the kind of level that you're at. Um, just with regards to going back to the kind of being stuck indoors. Um, the COVID-19 has is pretty much stopped all of archery. Is I, I'm sure that's pretty much the case where you are. Um, how, has, how has it affected you? Um, what effect has it had on archery in your country? And what are you doing to kind of keep your skills up to scratch, you know, training exercises and things like that? Um, yeah, so uh, everything stopped here uh, about archery. So the, the clubs are closed and all the competitions are cancelled uh, and we we don't know when it will start again so officially um, everything is closed until the 15th of April but uh, I I think it will go beyond that um, so uh, as I said I have a, a garden so <laughs> I shoot I shoot a lot uh, yeah. at the moment shoot every day uh, I think on average I've, I've been shooting 
260 euros every day, which is quite a lot for me. My fingers are not ready for that. They're yeah. training at the moment. <laughs> That's still pretty good. I mean, are you just are you just shooting at a target or are you doing any kind of bow drills or um, aiming drills, holding drills, anything like that? Um, the first week I did mostly shoot blank boss shooting at uh, three to five meters and shooting in front of a mirror, just working on my form. Um, I've, I have shot for five, for five months during the, the indoor season, uh, with a, an Olympic recurve. So I'm trying to get my bearable form back, which is quite a challenge. <laughs> is there a big switch between the two? I mean, obviously, uh, you know, if you use the under the chin anchor, then there's that and the clicker. Is it, is it completely different? Is it a complete kind of retraining of what you're doing? Uh, yeah, for me, it's, it's quite different. Uh, the, the big thing is the clicker. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it's, it's completely different, uh, because I was shooting in bearable, um, releasing the arrow with, um, the, the, the sight picture. Well, not the, the, what is the word for that? The, um, well, basically the, um, what with- was triggering the release was my sight picture on the target. Well, yeah, yeah. I don't I mean, have a sight in bearable, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. The same thing. When the arrow tip gets to a position on the target face, like on the gold or the bottom of the gold, that's your kind of... Was that your kind of go moment? Yeah, that that was how it was working. And uh, shooting with a clicker, I realized that uh, target panic vanished completely. Okay. Uh, thanks to the clicker. And now uh, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to find something similar for bearable. Yeah. Like, uh, like, like what you talked... Uh, on your previous podcast, like yeah. uh, cycle triggers and things like that. Yeah, yeah. With um, uh, I, I had Martin uh, Otterson and Joel um, Turner both using that kind of system, and another guy called uh, Dwight Dorsey, a really nice guy over there in America. He uses it. He shoots three D in IBO, um, and he's been using it. He, he basically said he could never ever shoot without a clicker. He just literally, he just couldn't hold on to the, uh, he even, he said he tried compound. He said, I, I couldn't even get, I couldn't even shoot a compound. You know, I'd miss the target with a compound. So he's always shot with a trigger. And then when the rules changed in, uh, I think it's recurve unlimited, um, he decided to go with the tab sear. And then he was found that a little bit inconsistent, he said to me. And then he tried the grip sear and he's kind of been sold on that for a, for a while now. Um, but yeah, I mean, mm. I've is I, is the the grips here legal in in World Archery Bearable? Well, a lot of people have been using it. This is what I find out with Martin Otterson. He said we've been using it for years, so people have been using it. It's not it. You can't modify the bow, so you can't modify the grip. You can't modify the riser. You can't add something to it. But it's not a device, apparently. I mean, I'm not an expert. I'm not a judge. I don't work for World Archery. But um, it, you're flicking your finger off the side of the riser or the side of the grip is not classed as a device. Uh, yeah. I knew there was something that had come out, which was like, um, it was like a little leather pouch, and inside it had like a bit of spring steel, and you pop that against the riser and you click that. But that's clearly mm. not legal because that's a, that's a device that you're adding to the bow. So, yeah, that's, yeah, some, that's what something I different. I mean, I've been trying something different altogether. It's an internal trigger. Um, Joel mentioned it, but I kind of, I've got, I've got a problem with using my nail as a, as a, a kind of one part of the sear. Is that due to like medical conditions? My nails think... will literally just bend, so I can't use that at all. So I'm using a different, different trigger internally. Yeah, I'm I'm asking myself a lot of questions at the moment. Uh, I've been trying all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard as well. It's very hard. I mean, I'm nowhere near the level of where you are. I'm I, like I always say, big disclaimer alert. I'm just a a club archer who is. I'm really interested in the kind of pathway to kind of the elite and the top levels and what people do. But we all seem to have, you know, issues with target panic. So. Um, it you know it doesn't go away even when you get to the top. It's whether you manage it better than the next guy. Oh yeah, I have big issues with with target planning, and I'm I'm sure it's uh, quite obvious when you look at all my all the different finals that I shot. 
uh, finishing uh, at the fourth place three times in a row. Uh, <laughs> you can see it right there. Yeah. Uh, what? I mean, how do you deal with the kind of pressure that you you're under at that time? Is that something that you consciously think about? Is that you know? Do do you have good shots and bad shots, or is it some that you're kind of managing on every shot? Well, uh, well, the 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 most difficult for me is during the finals, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I I used to have uh, no nothing to to really rely on during these finals, just uh, yeah. going through through my shots as usual. But with the with the stress, it yeah, with the extra can, stress, can yeah. get out of hand very easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, again, not at your level, but I. We have like a, a national indoor 18 metre um, competition, which is run at maybe seven or eight, maybe 10 different venues across the uh, UK. And um, when I was shooting that, I would shoot like 10, 10, 4, 10, <laughs> 10, 5. Uh, it just, I was just like, I'm kind of there's nothing I can do about it today it's a go home and <laughs> try and learn from the experience so it's it's very frustrating when you've got the kind of the the skills and you've put in the practice but it's it's that little extra thing that little I, I don't know whether it's a control or a compartmentalization of kind of saying well that bit I, I don't use that anymore but it's whether it creeps up. I mean, people do things and they kind of modify their shot, but it's whether the modification just, you just enter into like a honeymoon period where things seem to work and you kind of think it's working. This is working great. And then all of a sudden it's that, it's that one shot that happens and you kind of go, <laughs> Oh no, maybe not. Yeah. When it's working too great, then you start having expectations and start wondering how you're doing this great. And then, the panic comes back. <laughs> yeah, is that is that once you kind of? I had um, I had a um, a mindset coach on um, maybe a week or two ago. Um, yeah, I listened to that podcast as well. Yeah, he was saying, look, you know, you need to practice so much that you don't have to think. You need to have gone through mentally and visualized every scenario, anything that can go wrong, so nothing is a surprise. So when you get there, I, 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 I was watching a, a live feed yesterday because I was doing a little bit of research, a little bit of analysis into uh, why people shoot so well. Um, and I'd got my own little theories about it, um, which I'm going to keep to myself for the time being because I may be wrong. But um, hmm. uh, I was watching a final and it's happened twice now. Um, you, you've got your 20 second clock uh, on the indoors and you're kind of you know, basically you need to have your arrow ready in the bow, ready to go. So, you know, when it's your turn to shoot, you raise the bow, you go through your process, you shoot your shot. But I've seen two finals now where the arrows just fell off the rest and the archer's just gone into complete meltdown. Um, the one I was watching yesterday, they were in the lead by, it was 4-0 and they were in the lead uh, and they registered a big fat zero for that shot because they could not get the arrow back on the rest. And mm. I was kind of thinking, maybe that's something that you should envision. You've dealt with it. And then when it happens, you don't panic about it anymore. Yeah, I think uh, visualization is, is a great tool. Uh, I've just not put in the, the work into this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I know I know a lot of theory about it and I I'm sure it's beneficial to do this. Yeah. I mean, Morris was saying to me um, before and after the chat that he wouldn't he wouldn't take on anyone that couldn't do meditation, couldn't do visualization. He said, you know, for me, it's kind of hopeless if they can't do those things because that shows that they're not committed enough. But um, I mean, he was working with people who, uh, you know, they're, they're there in front of, you know, 50, 60, 70,000 thousand people and you know millions of people watching on TV and they're under pressure already and they've got to they've got to perform so he was like the amount of the detail and the preparation that goes into creating a, a performance he said you know most people aren't prepared to do it and that's why they're not champions 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I started I started doing a meditation in 20, 2015. Okay. Uh, but it's not something I've I've managed to do regularly. I don't I don't have the discipline. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It just takes. I mean, I find that I kind of I started doing it a long time ago, but I have like kind of fits and starts of, you know, I'll do it for a few weeks and then I'll, you know, I'll have a change of routine and then I won't do it again for another few weeks. It's not. I'm never. You need to really be totally committed. I think. You're an archery coach as well, aren't you, David? Uh, yeah. In fact, I, I started a, a one-year formation to to be an archery coach this year. Um, so um, I'm I'm kind of a trainee at the moment, and then I am I pass my diploma at the end of of the the season. So uh, in France, we have this this uh, formation and. Um, uh, it starts in September and it finishes in in June, and you have uh, 15 weeks of um, of full well 15 full weeks of formation that are dispatched throughout throughout the year. And uh, in between, I I do coaching in my club near Toulouse. Okay. And um, is that something that you found like does it as it um, helped with your um with your shooting as well or has it helped you kind of is it giving you any kind of insight into what you do and how you do it oh yeah i've, I've learned a lot of things uh so this this formation is only for olympic recurve archery so uh, i i had to swap to a um, to an olympic recurve for the indoor season to uh, to to know what i'm talking about okay um and yeah i uh, there, there were plenty of things I didn't know about about the, the the form, the posture, the simple technical things, and also I I learned a lot a lot about how to um, to prepare your 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 season for to for your objectives and how to um, to organize everything. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's one thing I'm <laughs> I'm trying to do at the minute is that um, I mean it's terrible that we've had all this kind of disruption, um, but to be to be quite honest, I mean, I didn't have anything organised for this season. I had competitions booked in, but that's easy. That's just going online, filling out a form and paying, a, you know, a little bit of money. But in terms of preparing myself, preparing my kit and training for those competitions, I, I really did absolutely nothing, nothing planned. It was all kind of ad hoc um you know on the hoof not really any kind of rhyme or reason to it um and i think that's one of the critical things is that you know if you've got the time and you've got the kind of knowledge is that putting the hours in to to plan your training and plan you know um what where you want to peak for what competitions and stuff like that that's kind of vital to kind of being in the right kind of form before you come to a major competition or something that you uh, that you want to go and kind of win at. Yeah, I think it's very important to um, optimize things a little, <laughs> at yeah, least. Yeah. Um, I, I used to to be just like you, just just practice and shoot arrows all year long, not uh, yeah, not planning everything. So um, it can work at 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 least at the bearable level. It can work, but when you you go and you go against um, professional archers in olympic shooting it's it's not possible anymore and in bearable the, the level is rising a lot i think so yeah definitely it's 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 good to start uh practicing in a more efficient way <laughs> you're listening to the Bearble archery podcast don't touch that dial so what what type of you did the um uh, the Olympic recurve for a bit over the indoors was it? Did you do a, few, a couple of competitions with the Olympic recurve as well? Yes, yeah, I I did uh, just eighteen meter shooting. Okay, and um, I actually qualified for the French Championships, and I ended up at the tenth place. Oh, that's good. Well done. So uh, yeah, <laughs> I think it's it's pretty good in for for five months of shooting. So that was fun. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> so. In terms of archery, what what are your favourite games of archery? Do you do do you prefer three D and field, or do you like shooting the kind of you know target fifty meters, eighteen meters? What's what's your preference and why? Uh, 
my my favorite one is probably probably uh, field archery. That's what I started with, and then uh, then I I moved to 3D shooting and then indoor. And we also have 2D shooting in France, but I don't don't really enjoy 2D. The rules are different. Uh, it's it's a bit weird. <laughs> I've not heard of it, but yeah. Yeah. Anyway, in, in two, so in two, yeah, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about it because it's it's yeah. funny. Uh, so in two D, we have uh, targets. Uh, the targets are pictures of animals, a bit like three D. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, you have to shoot two arrows in thirty seconds, and you have to shoot one arrow. Uh, well, you have two different pegs, and you are, you have to shoot one arrow at each peg. So <laughs> you have to move in between the arrows. Okay. And you have only 30 seconds to estimate the distance and, and basically throw your two arrows. Throw. throw. <laughs> is, that, is that literally what you do? Because you've that's, got no that's time. That's what you... it feels like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we do the, um, the, the 2Ds uh, here as a, on, basically on a 3D course, but they have um, – it's a different organization. It's not a World Archery affili- affiliated organization. It's called NFAS. Um, so they do 3Ds, which they usually shoot uh, 40 targets with, and it's just one arrow. So, you know, you're not getting a lot of arrows in um, when you shoot that round, unless you miss, in which case you move to the next peg and you and you take another shot. And if you miss again, <laughs> you move to the next nearest peg and you have another shot. Um, but obviously the points rewarded for a, a hit on the animal in a, you know, in whatever zone they go down the closer you get um yeah. but they also do the they have um two championships one is the 3ds which is obviously fairly self-explanatory it's uh 3d animals and then they have a 2ds which is uh well what they call the nationals i think which is the same as what you say it's basically uh that they're, they're actually they're not paper targets they're like vinyl you know um really th- um plastic like plastic cloth with um the kind of all weather things but with a a, a printed picture a, a hd printed picture of an animal on it um the, okay. they, they're really quite i mean the the pictures themselves are really good um but that is you're essentially shooting um a 3d course a, onto like a 2d target just a it, it's a target it's it's a to all intents and purposes, a, a paper target, but it's a picture of an animal. So, yeah, it sounds fairly similar, but with they've not got the 30-second different peg rule. That sounds a bit kind of bizarre. Yeah, that's that's the the thing that bugs me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Is, that, is that popular in France? Is that something that's big there, or is it something that's a little niche? Oh, it's actually quite popular, and it's uh, it's it's a French thing. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you, you, can't, you, don't, you don't find it anywhere else. Uh, but yeah, it's it's popular among hunters mostly. Right. Yeah, I can see why that is. Yeah, um, is is archery itself popular in France, uh, and is bearbow popular in France? I think we have the the biggest world archery uh, feder. Well, we are the biggest in world archery federation, I okay. think, in France. Uh, but then bearbow bearbow is getting more and more popular, but. Uh, obviously, we don't have the level of uh, the Swedes and the the Italians. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they're very strong. There's so many. Um, you know, if one retires, another one just steps in to take their place. And if one doesn't qualify, um, you know, you know, especially with Sweden, if one of the guys doesn't qualify, there's another guy that's in the finals um, who's also on the Swedish team. So they've always got someone there taking a medal home, practically. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was I, I was speaking to Martin. I was asking him why why is that, but I, I don't think he was like going to let me have the secret. <laughs> yeah, in France, it uh, the level is is quite lower. Uh, so basically, uh, I've been at the top with a quite a fair fair amount of points ahead, and uh, I was the the only one uh, being selected in most of the championships i did <laughs> yeah yeah uh, you did the um you did the all british and open um was it last year in northern ireland was that is that right yeah that's right i i had fun over there <laughs> yeah yeah you you shot a big score was it 679 or something like that uh i'm not sure i can't remember 
Yeah, because uh... they were the the guys in second and third place were the some of the guys that I kind of shoot with, uh, not regularly, but because the bare bow and the kind of field and three D is quite a small uh, sport in the UK. There's literally, you know, on the mainland, Northern Ireland are kind of crazy for field and three D. I think they they host a lot of events, um, whereas in the UK, I mean, at one time there were a handful of events. So I kind of see those people, Paul and Stephen, uh, on, on a fairly regular basis um, at, at the comps. But six, I think it was 6.79. I mean, it's a big score. That, how did you enjoy that competition? And how did you enjoy what was the crack like over in Northern Ireland? <laughs> it was really nice. Uh, um, for, I think it was not raining during this weekend, so it was pretty nice. <laughs> it's quite a change because I, I did a few few courses over there, and uh, uh, you guys are crazy. <laughs> In France, we we stop competitions for well outdoor competitions for winter, but over there, I I did a, a few shots and. Uh, <laughs> Shot in the rain, in the cold, even yeah. under the snow. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is, if you don't shoot in the rain and the cold and the mud and the snow, then you would never shoot in the UK. So, uh, no, it's not always that bad. It's not always that bad. I've been in some bad ones, but it's not always like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I was over... Where was I? I was over in Northern Ireland a week or two ago, just before everything kind of got shut down. So it's really nice out there. They've got they've just got so much land available that they can they can put courses on and stuff like that um it just it seems just by the kind of competition listings that they kind of shoot you know all the way through the year and the NFAS in the UK with the 3Ds that's exactly the same i mean it's only closed now because of uh, covid-19 but they mm. shoot all year round i mean the, the 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 competitions thin out towards the end of october beginning of november and it, they're kind of thin on the ground until February. But there is still, if you if you do want to shoot you can, and you can travel, then you, you can go and shoot. Um, just want to move on to your your, your kit, the, the stuff that you shoot and the stuff that you choose to shoot. Because um, they do seem to make some good limbs in France. Oh, yeah, they do. <laughs> I don't, I, I've heard of them, but obviously, um, I mean... Yeah, I have never tried Uka. <laughs> yeah, I've got some. They're they're actually <laughs> my bow is like um, right behind me right now with a pair of uh, pair of Ukas, just the humble um, bottom of the range ones, but they're still uh, they're still good limbs. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, I've been uh, sponsored by Uka for a few years. I don't know how you say it in English. I think you say Uka or something. Like yeah, that. yeah. I think a lot of people just say Uka. Yeah. Yeah. So is it you? Is it Yuka? Is that really what it's? Is you just that... say Yuka in <laughs> French. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, it's a um, it's a Mongolian word. Uh, like it comes from a, a Mongol Mongolian feast about archery or something like that. I'm not sure. Okay. So it's not a French word. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, they they do a uh, very very nice limbs and also risers. Um, I shoot a full Yuka bow now. Right. Is that a carbon riser as well? Yeah, it's a full carbon riser, yeah. How does that so feel? What, what's the kind of, what's the difference between that? I mean, I've never shot a carbon riser, so personally I wouldn't know, but um, what's the, what, if you've shot aluminium man carbon, what's the, what's the difference in terms of the, the shot and the kind of feel? Oh, I'm not so sure. Not not that sensitive in that regard. <laughs> right. I think right. I can shoot whatever, but. What yeah. I can say is that it 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 works pretty well. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously, yeah, you're world champion at three D, so he obviously <laughs> it's obviously doing something right. Um, yeah. And what what other other kit have you got? What kind of string? What kind of uh, rest and uh, plunger and that kind of thing? Um, what do I shoot? I shoot uh forty pounds. Okay. Uh, yeah. At at my draw length, and uh, I shoot um what is the string uh. 8125 yeah what yeah. is that yeah uh, yeah 8125 yeah bc That's... bcy i think yeah i've just is I, that I've the, just... the brand i'm not sure <laughs> i think i think it's just referred to because they, they, there's two different there was uh was it brownells and bcy the two different people that were were selling i don't know if they're the same thing but they've got 
they've each got a different name for it, so they're probably the same thing. But yeah, I used to shoot the the eighty one twenty fives, but um, I, I've tried a little experiment going to um, Spectra six fifty two because I did shoot an eighty one ninety string, which I found was a little bit harsh. Um, so I, I kind of I thought well, I'm going to go the other end now uh, and try something that's quite soft supposedly quite soft so but i've not got anything to report about it because i'm just <laughs> i'm just doing like kind of bow practice in the house at the minute um mm. do you have any do you have any sponsors does that does anyone sponsor you to shoot uh well yeah there's a uh, uka for a start and then yeah. there's um arc system uh it's which is uh, another french company who makes really good um plungers and um arrow rests do they do the magnetic plunger is that them Yes, they do, and uh, they have a new a new plunger this year, uh, which is a, which has clicks like a bit like the Bita plunger. Okay, so it's really good. Yeah, especially for Bevo because uh, that's basically how you <laughs> you tune your your well. If you shoot left and right, that's that's what you will uh, touch on the spot. Yeah, it's your plunger. Yeah, and. In terms of arrows, what are you shooting in terms of arrows for your kind of... Is it £40 pounds on the fingers or is it £40 pound limbs? It's uh, £38 pounds, thirty eight pound limbs and £40 pounds on the fingers. And I shoot, the, I shoot what, uh, 18 strands on my string? Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, and I shoot uh, Victory 3DHV arrows. Okay, what, what's so, fine? Uh, uh, 600 all right, yeah, but but they are really short. <laughs> are they? What? Like, uh, yeah, they nearly uh, fall off uh, my my wrist <laughs> when I when I have my fingers under the the knocks. Is there a, is there a reason for that? I uh, just wanted to cut weight as much as possible. Right. Because uh, in three D, uh, if I'm if I'm off in my range finding, uh, I want to mitigate the the mistake. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, I was speaking to. Uh, Dwight the other day, I think it was, I think I was on uh, on Facebook, and he was saying that he shoots the, I think I don't know if it's the five hundreds, the the V one elites, the VAPs, um, yeah, uh, or it might be six hundreds, but he was saying his arrow weight was like two hundred and thirty seven grains or something like that. Uh, are your arrows kind of a, a similar uh, a similar weight? Um, actually, I I measure that in grams, not in not oh, in right. grains. So right, I'm not right. sure. <laughs> I would so have to do the conversion. What What are yours in grams then? And I'll do the conversion later on. <laughs> um, I think I think they are seventeen point four grams, um, something like that. Yeah, and I shoot a hundred grain uh, points. Right. Okay. So I've I've tried shooting uh, lighter points, but uh, the the grouping just explodes at longer distances. Yeah. Doesn't doesn't work for me. Yeah, I've I've heard that on on a lot of people have said like they don't go under a hundred. He was saying he was shooting eighty grains, but I, I've heard people say, look, I've tried, you know, just on the field, I've got the target and I've sat there and I've shot arrow after arrow, group after group. I've plotted them all on some kind of app where you can see where the groups are. And when I shoot anything under 100 grains, my, my groups just open up. So, I mean, one one guy I know kind of says, it's like, it's it's the same arrow every time with a 110 grain point. I always go for the same thing because I know it works for me. I've tested it and it, it's completely kind of, I've completely proven it to myself that this is the setup that works for me. So if you have that kind of... Um, knowledge and that kind of experience then i'm sure it makes kind of setting up arrows and doing the tuning a lot easier yeah um i i, I wouldn't go under 100 grain points um i don't i don't feel a big difference between 100 and 120 so i just i just stick to 100 because i i gain a i gain quite quite a lot of speed like that yeah so it's it's good for 3d yeah, have you chronoed your your um, setup? Um, no, I'd like to do that, but I, I don't have what is, what is required for that. No. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was saying he knows exactly what his uh, speed is, so I'm like, 
I'm obviously like kind of really slipping down on all of the things I need to do to set my bow up. <laughs> do you have any kind of special things that you do like tuning wise at all? Or is it a kind of, you know, you, you kind of set your brace height, you set your tiller at something that you kind of like, and then, you know, you use your kind of usual arrow recipe and then off you go. Or are there spe anything special that you do? Or do you not think the kind of, once you get past the kind of basic tune, anything else is going to help you that much? Um, so what I do is usually I put uh, my tiller at plus five on the bottom lane. Okay. Uh, uh, which is inverted uh, inverted compared to uh, the um, Olympic recurves. They, they put plus five on top. But I ju it just feels better for me on on my fingers to um, to have a bit less uh, less pressure on on the um, on the bottom finger. Um, then I I just shoot I just do my tuning with a bear shaft and I go for it. <laughs> is that at eighteen or is that at thirty? Um, I do it at eighteen twenty meters. I don't I don't bother going any further because uh, in bear you do your your crawling and the um, the arrow uh, will be only will only be tuned perfectly for one distance. Yeah, so yeah. I choose I choose a fairly short or medium distance and I do it there. Yeah. I mean, do you see a lot of, if, you know, when you're kind of crawling up and down the string, do, does your setup, does it see a lot of left and right variation or have you got your setup kind of tuned now by experience that, you know, you don't, you don't have to touch the, um, the, the spring tension on the plunger? Um, last, last year, um, during, during the world championships, it was, uh, working, all working fine. Uh, no, no issues with left and right arrows, depending on the distances. But uh, during the previous years and uh, all throughout the the season, uh, I had to adjust my my well the the stiffness of, of the plunger according to every distance, uh, starting from thirty meters. So, <laughs> so I had to. I I don't remember if it was. Um, um, Adding tension or or removing tension, but um, every five meters I had to do like four clicks on my plunger um, to 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 be able to aim at the center all the time. <laughs> and is that something you kind of did you work that out on the course, or was that something you'd kind of worked out in practice, you know, well before that? Oh, you you have to to do that uh, during practice, and then then you see what really happens during competitions because. Um, I I I find that I I always shoot a bit differently during competitions, so I have to figure it out um, on a, on a course as well. <laughs> in, in, in what way? Do what what changes with you? Is that because recently, like especially with the Joel Turner thing? I mean, myself and Joel had chatted offline after and before we did our kind of marathon like two hour chat. And he was saying, look, you know, you're not taking the same body to the line when you go to competition. You, when you're at home and you're shooting your your blank boss in your back garden, you're 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 the king of your 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 own backyard. So you're not nervous, you're not tense, your muscles aren't stiff, you're not thinking about anything. He said, when you kind of step up on that line, you get yellow line fever, and you know your muscles get tense, your heart rate increases. It's not you physically not the same as what you do at home unless you prepare that and you do that at home is that's what is what differences do you find yeah uh for me it's 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 never the same between uh training and competition you can try to get close uh, well to to get them close to to one another but uh yes not the same so um it, i think I, I can have two different effects in competition. So either it's um, I stop uh, to I stop trying to shoot and I let things happen and they I, maybe I shoot a bit more relaxed and I don't I just allow myself to to do to just shoot what uh, in the way that my body wants to shoot on the spot and um, so in so I may be more relaxed uh, or if I'm really stressed I can be. Uh, more tensed and uh, that's that's uh, how it's also different from training so 
yeah. don't know. Many many different things can can be different. <laughs> do do you find that you start thinking during kind of finals and stuff like that? Thoughts start to creep in. You start thinking about um, your opponent, what your opponent's doing, or what score you've shot in the last arrow. Do do you even at your level does that still happen, or is that you just like now nah, I've got a, my mind's blank. I do my shot process. <laughs> Oh, I'd love, I'd love to have a blank mind during these moments. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the funny but, thing is, yeah. I've got, I've got a blank mind ninety nine percent of the rest of the time. Um, it's just a, <laughs> there's not a lot going on. It's just as soon as I step out on a course, that's when <laughs> I start thinking. It's bizarre. Yeah, well, uh, I guess when I'm, I'm in finals, there's the ego that starts kicking in and making up all the, the stories about what will happen if you win or lose or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So is that kind of something that, I mean, if you've, if I don't know if you chat to the kind of other competitors, but is that something that's kind of common even at, even at an elite level? Um, I'm not so sure. I, I, I don't talk about that too much. Uh, but I th- yeah I, I believe it's it's quite the same for most people. <laughs> yeah, I mean I mean I mean if if Martin I, I I don't we didn't get into that detail. He was telling me that he kind of he didn't care about a shot process up until uh, the only thing he cared about was his elbow position because he knew he had troubles with that. Um, and then once he kind of got to anchor, that's when his shot started, and it was all about kind of controlling his mind at that point um and eventually he'd had problems he said like he, he actually shot his name tag and the name board that was 10 meters in front of where he was shooting mm-hmm. and the target was another eight meters behind that um and he said that's when i needed to kind of obviously something had changed um because he was saying he could shoot absolute massive scores in practice um but then the the reality of competition it was very very different um, and he tried a different system where he was kind of using this triggered shot. And he said his, you know, the absolute massive scores came down, but the kind of competition scores came up, you know, by quite a long way. And that he, he then said something that I found really interesting was that he said he no longer worried about the shot, that he didn't think during the shot, but because he wasn't worried about the shot anymore, he started to get nervous uh, and think about other stuff that was nothing to do with his shooting. So I was like, well, that's that's interesting in itself, is that, you know, he's he's combated one thing, but those kind of, you know, you know, those thoughts that you don't necessarily want in your head, they find another way to come in. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't have any control in my shots, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's that's what uh, I what, that's the way I used to shoot. I used to just let things happen and have basically zero control of, or <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, you, you, maybe, obviously... maybe I would I would focus on one technical point and just let the rest happen, basically. And what did you what did you focus on in terms of that that technical point? What is your kind of what is your kind of rock that your anchor, the thing that in your shot, you know, if you do that right, 95% of the time things, it's going to, it's going to go good. Is there one thing in your, in your shot that you kind of say, this is what I really do really strong. And if I do this right, then I'm sure it's going to be fine. Well, it's something that can change, uh, throughout the year it could change a lot um last year when i was in canada i think i was just focusing on relaxing my front hand and just just letting the rest happen uh something like that <laughs> yeah because uh, uh, yeah I'm, I'm it's kind of it's weird that you say that because i've just been reading um a couple of books that i got um delivered that came over i couldn't find them anywhere other than one particular shop um and both of them said that that you need the bow arm unit is part of the kind of the strength of a shot, but at the same time you need a relaxed bow hand and a relaxed forearm in the bow to stop you making any kind of talks, any kind of sudden movements. Um, 
is that something that you kind of feel is a strong part of your shot and when you focused on that i mean obviously you won the world championship you stood on the top the top of the uh, top of the podium and you got a gold medal so you were obviously doing something right um uh, yeah i think it's it's interesting to focus your attention on on something on a either um, a point that is either a weak point that is not fully automated or on 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 a strong point uh, that that will not be um, that will not have any or oh, what is the how can I say that um, so basically focusing my attention on my front hand I I knew that uh, it would not interfere on my shot cycle yeah um and even if it's something that is quite automated uh i know that even if i get tension in my hand the the shot will will happen properly so um the idea is to to not focus on on the other um points that are automated to just let them happen <laughs> yeah without any yeah. without any interferences I'm not sure if it makes any sense. No, no, it does. It does. In it, like, I, I mean, I, when I do some like really simple tasks, um, I can tell when my a different part of my brain from the kind of automated side is trying to like take over because then the mistakes come in. And I, I'm like, one of the things is trying to type without looking at the keys on a keyboard. Um, I can do it, but then there'll there'll be some part of me that wants to kind of wrestle control away from doing it automatically and then the mistakes will happen and then I start being careful um because I'm trying to do it and I, that for me has like a crossover into my archery as well is that when I'm fully kind of automatic and I'm letting the kind of automatic do it it's it's fine until I get to a point where the whether it's another part of the subconscious or a part of the conscious mind kind of comes in and says, actually, I want to, I want control of this. I'm not quite happy that <laughs> I'm not in control here. And it starts like, it's like an ex, having an extra hand coming in while you're kind of doing the job. It's like, you know, a third foot suddenly like appearing and you're trying to drive a car and it's like pressing on the brake and, you know, pressing on the accelerator when you don't want to stop and you don't want to speed up. So for me, that's that's the kind of um, thing that I get. Um, is is there some like kind of similar for you? Is it is it is it something where where you've kind of set something up and then is it a doubt or is it like um, is it just something else that decides I want to have a go? I want to be involved in this. Uh, not really. That there was nothing like that uh, before I started uh, asking myself questions. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it, it was not completely effic efficient because, uh, obviously target panic was, and is still a big issue with me. Right. And uh, just talking about the, the Lac La Biche, can you talk us through that, that competition and kind of qualifying for it and going out there, what it's like kind of, you know, from start to finish, you know, you get your you know, you get your place to go to the... Because um, you were saying earlier that, that the bare bow's not that strong. So was it fairly easy for you to qualify to for the, the place to go to Lac La Biche? Uh, you mean to get into the French team? Yeah, to get into the team and then to get picked to go to the uh, the, the World Archery uh, 3D finals. Yeah, so um, in France, uh, we have only one weekend of selection to to get uh, picked in in the team. So it's um, it's a competition that is set on two days. Uh, first day is a qualification round, and second day you have um, you have dual dual situations basically, uh, and then uh, semifinals and finals. So um, I I won this these selections. Um, how many places do they? How many athletes do they send in each division? Oh, not not many. Um, it was something like 14, 14 archers for the the whole French team. Um, if you look at all the different bows, right? Okay. Uh, what, what's, so in, what's the uh, French um, French um, national? 
body for archery. What's it called? Um, so in French, it's uh, Fédération Française de Tir à l'Arc, which is the French Federation of Archery. Right, okay. And they're the, they're the people who kind of govern, do they govern most of the archery in France? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and they, they, they're the World Archery Affiliated Association, are they? Yeah, there's there's another association which is which is not affiliated to a world archery, but uh, I don't know anything about it. Right. Okay. And so you got you won the event, I presume, and then you were on the squad. Yeah. So um, if you want to be sure to be selected, you have to win the event, and then uh, they will pick one or two more archers uh, in your in your of, of the with the same bow if they think that uh, they have the level to to win a medal at the the world championships okay and then do, do the is it the ffta is that correct yeah that's right uh, do they do they sponsor you to go or do they do, do you have to kind of pay for it, pay for it yourself or are you you know is there kind of an incentive to kind of go and other than your own kind of personal pride and you want to take that title well, in France, we like to to complain because they they don't take many archers, but they actually pay for everything. Wow, so, that's good. That's good. <laughs> so the ones the ones that go are pretty lucky. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so uh, yeah, no expenses at all. You, they pay for everything from when you leave your home to get to the the plane and until you go back to your home. And how many? How how big is the FFTA? Is it is it how many members roughly? I mean. I don't, I'm not asking for uh, like a specific, uh, you know, you need to say it's like 65,382, but is it a big organization? How many how many members roughly does it have? Uh, your estimation was pretty close. It's it's around that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> around 60,000, yeah. Oh, cool, cool. Oh, so it's big. I mean, it's bigger than the, the UK, but I mean, and the UK is like, oh, I think it's about 45,000 in the, um, in Archery GB. Um and the NFAS is is only about six thousand, but they're just like they all they do is three D, and they're they're out every week, week in week out. But so you get the kind of go ahead. Um, so what what do you do next? Do you start practicing, or do you start thinking I need to change my bow and my setup and my form and you know that like the kind of thing that people like me do on a regular basis. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Nobody... So you're, su you're supposed to be fully ready uh, when you do the selections and then it's just, uh, just, just keeping in shape. <laughs> yeah. So, when... no... so usually, um, the selections are one or two months before the, the event. Cool. So they so get, you don't, so you they don't get... have time to change anything. Yeah. Plus, <laughs> you, it, you know, if, if you've won the selection event, presume that you're kind of in form at that point. So as long as there's not a huge time between you being selected and the event, then presumably as long as you kind of stay in shape, you should be good to go. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the logic behind these selections. I think, uh, if you, if you win the selections, then it means that you're, you're ready to go. <laughs> yeah. It, it doesn't leave any mis, mis uh, place for mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. So and you have to win or you don't go. <laughs> And and then after that you kind of you book in flights and uh, or do they do all that for you and then you kind of get your gear on the plane. I mean, they, I've never travelled overseas with my equipment, so I wouldn't know how to go about it at all. I mean, is that a complicated thing or is it just something like you know just taking the bows on the plane? It's just some pretty standard for you now. Uh, it's it's not me doing the booking; it's uh, the FFTA doing it. Okay. So I just I just take my uh, train tickets to get to Paris, which is where we take the plane all together, and uh, they 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 do. We let the coaches do everything basically. Yeah, <laughs> they they have the they have the plane tickets, and we just uh, check in uh, our luggage. And then, uh, are you taking um, are you taking a, your main bow, and do you have a, like a backup bow or backup limbs or anything like that? Do you take two, you know, identical setups just in case one you have an equipment issue or anything like that? Yeah, um, I take everything in double. Um, yeah. 
So I I put one bow in uh, each suitcase basically. I have two two suitcases, and uh, the other archers of the team they usually uh, s uh, swap uh, one bow with another another archer, uh, just in case one luggage uh, gets lost yeah. in, the, in yeah. the process. Yeah, that was something I I, I read um, Lanny Basham's. Um... Uh, with winning in mind, he said he did that um, when they went to, I think it was Moscow or something like that, and uh, his uh, his uh, gun mysteriously disappeared, but his backup gun was in his teammate's, uh, teammate's luggage, so he had, like, the backup gun. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's obviously that's uh, it's kind of a fairly standard thing. And when you arrive at the other end, I mean, is it... Are you kind of like... Are you like a, a set of footballers and you kind of get set off into like you know your own hotel away from everyone else and you just train together is it is it like that i mean i don't know so this is interesting for me um usually you have uh different hotels where they um put all the archers yeah um, but they uh by by countries so you can have uh, uh three or four con different countries in the same hotel um do you kind of socialize and do you kind of train together or do you kind of stick stick with your own kind of team or do you go and see people you haven't seen for a long time um yeah yeah we we can socialize we're not uh, just uh, stuck with our team and keep keep together for for the whole time we can move around <laughs> yeah and did, was it um was the accommodation close to uh, to where the event was taking place or did you have like you know, a, a five-hour drive or anything like that? Uh, so in Lac La Biche, uh, it was just a 10-minute drive to get to the to the course. And yeah. there were buses that were uh, arranged for that um, every hour or so oh, uh, cool. from, from the hotels. And do you get to kind of go and practice whenever you want or is it strictly kind of limited to like times and places that world archery... Uh, um kind of set down or can you make your own arrangements and stuff like that um so the, there's a, a a practice field which is um opened according to a uh, different different hours I'm, i can't remember exactly but you can go there and train whenever you want when it's opened oh that's good did you use that a lot or we kind of like i've you know I'm ready. I don't need to kind of practice and practice. Or did you did you go and practice knowing that you were just doing it to kind of stave off nerves or something like that? Oh yeah, you want to uh, to practice uh, the the day before uh, or the days before if you arrive a bit earlier. You want to just get in the in the competition uh, before getting on the course, and you want to uh, to to check that everything is all right, that uh, your shots are just just flowing. Uh, naturally <laughs> and when you were i mean spoiler alert i mean everyone's going to know obviously now that you, you won the event i mean what was shooting the event like what was the kind of competition like itself you know the other archers i mean you you, you touched on it before saying you know the level of bare bow archery overall is is increasing and i think you can see that from the indoors especially you know um you know with scores just going up and up and up yeah <laughs> um so did you find that the kind of the level of competition the level of professionalism all that had gone up as well and how did you find the event itself the kind of the organization and the courses and stuff like that because someone was asking me a while back about what are the world records for like 3d and field archery and i was like well i'm not I, i'm not an expert i, I but how would you judge that? Because no two courses are identical. Um, but what was the course like in comparison to the courses that you've that you've already shot and the kind of, you know, the, the groups you were with and kind of the overall kind of experience and the whether had archery, bearbow archery taken a, you know, a real step up in gear? Um, yeah, so the, the courses were really nice. Um, um... What surprised me was the the size of the the animals. They were they were a lot bigger than what I'm used to shoot in France. Okay. <laughs> in in France, we we sh for for those who who know uh, Robion, where the the previous world championships were 
well held. Uh, that that's what we shoot all the time. Very small animals, and we pretty far. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. we we never we never have big animals really close, and uh, that's that's the the difference that 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 was quite quite challenging to to deal with when uh, when I was shooting in Canada because there were these enormous animals really close and my my range finding was completely uh lost <laughs> especially during the first day <laughs> yeah so uh, <laughs> it was new new targets targets that I had never seen and uh the distances were were really difficult for me to find so but then I uh, then I got I got used to it on the the second day of qualifications. I stopped looking at the targets. I just just started looking at the at the ground basically and uh, <laughs> uh, range finding. Just looking at the ground, not the targets, because they would it would mess mess with my head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've 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 heard that. Um, I, I I shoot three D. Um, I'm not a very experienced. I've maybe shot. Um, I think my first 3D was the uh, UK National Championship. So <laughs> that was my first um, mm -hmm. 3D. And I've only shot maybe like four or five since since then, um, NFAS and uh, World Archery. Um, and I, 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 some people seem to find the, the distance judging to be a bit of a nightmare. Is is there a is there a secret to it or is there a system? I mean I've asked this of mm, maybe three or four different competitors now. Uh, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. Uh the 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 way I do it is is probably the most simple way. I just I just uh count on the on the ground uh 5 meters by 5 meters until I reach the target. <laughs> And do you think yeah, if, so, if you're if you're off, you kind of your arrow speed is what kind of helps you out there? Yeah. Uh, so usually I, I I just count like that, looking at the at the ground, and I also look at the target, and I I I just think to myself uh, at what distance I would. Uh, well, I see the target just just like that, but um, when when you don't know the target, uh, it's kind of really put your <laughs> your your estimations off like like it was doing in Canada <laughs> and you got through you got through day 1 obviously um and what was that your adjustment then was your adjustment was i'm going to stop looking at the targets because i'm not used to seeing the animal targets this big this close so was that was that really like kind of messing with your head yeah that that was the main point uh, then I just on, I just relax a bit more on the second day, um, and uh, and it it worked pretty well. <laughs> yeah, and you did, was there a lot of kind of terrain involved, or was there a, was it easy to kind of count um, like five meters to the target on the ground because the, the the layout was kind of clear ground, or was there a lot of things in the way, um, you know, gaps and dips and trees and stuff like that or was it just fairly flat and you could kind of go that's my five that's my 10 that's my 15 that looks about 22 um if i remember correctly it was was in 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 woods and it was pretty flat so right um usually i think we could see the 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 the, the ground before the target and i think <laughs> what what do you do when you can't see the ground all the way up to the target do you have any kind of special recipe for that uh i just uh try to to look at the the, the trees around and i just count in the air basically <laughs> yeah yeah so you kind of projecting what the ground would be up in a straight line to the target then yeah that that's what i would do cool i mean I, that's another thing i've been looking at i do want to improve my um my 3D this year, um, and the last one I shot, the, my my kind of my reading of the distances was pretty good, but my target panic was just kind of it. It just got on top of me from uh, from from the very first target. Mm -hmm. So I I had like a lot of left and rights just because I was like flinching. I was all over the place, but that the the kind of the the ground judging is something I would definitely want to kind of 
try and work on to improve because the NFAS one that I shoot, I mean, their targets go out to like 70 yards. So it's, you know, it's it's a big target at 70 yards, but it's it's a long way and a lot of, you know, there's a lot of room for error on those yeah. targets. Yeah, you can you can practice uh, range finding during your trainings or even when you just walk down the street. Just <laughs> how do you do that? What what's your practice for that? Um, when I practice on the um, on the shooting range, I I put like um, what's that? Um, little flags on the floor. Yeah, every like five, mark, every, markers. Yeah. yeah, little marks on the floor every five meters. I just I just uh, put my plant my arrows every ten meters <laughs> uh, yeah. from the um, shooting line to the target and uh, every, before each shot I I um, I train to uh, find the 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 distance like that um, I train my eyes to find the five ten fifteen twenty meters and so on and um, then if I'm if I'm uh, on the street, I can just uh, look at uh, a lamppost and um, count uh, how far I see it. And then with my with my steps, uh, I know that if I make uh, six steps, it's uh, exactly five meters. So it's really accurate to uh, to check the the distance like that. Cool, and that's something you do like pretty regularly, is it? Um, I would do that uh, mostly when approaching the the competition. I I don't think about doing it uh, <laughs> um, any other time of the year. Uh, what? How far out would you start your um, your preparation for a competition? So, say you've got you know a European field or a European three D or a World three D. How far in advance would you kind of? start to think I need to train more specifically for this what what would what would um, what would be the point where you say this is what I need to do oh, well in Bebo it's quite difficult to um, to program your your whole season because uh, you have competition uh, all year long all throughout the year <laughs> especially especially in France you have the indoor season. And then you have the 2D or field seasons that are completely stuck to the end of the indoor season. And then you have the 3D, 3D season. It's, um, so it's, it's, it's pretty hard to, uh, to, um, plan for that. <laughs> so I, I used to have zero planning. I, I, I think a bit more about it, uh, next year when I'll, I'll, I'll shoot bare ball again. Probably. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be some time before we get out and shoot any competitions. Uh, when do you kind of think that you might be back competing, um, given the situation in France as it is? I was supposed to do my first field uh, competition last weekend. Um, but no, I, I don't know. Uh, probably in June or July, it will it will start again. Hopefully. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe in May, but no, it seems pretty close. Yeah. So you're in the you you kind of you're in the the running for qualifying for finals. How many um, in Lac La Biche? How many? So you get you you post two days worth of scores, I, I presume, and then from that you kind of you're kind of seeded. You know, one through is it the top sixteen they take, or is it the top thirty two? Um. I'm not. Sh I, I can't remember exactly how many they take, but uh, the first two archers they have uh, they have a buy-in for the um, semi-finals. Yeah, yeah. So the so the um, the top two qualifiers they get a buy straight through. They don't have to do any eliminations. Yeah, they just um, what do what do they do? They 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 shoot against uh, the 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 two winners of the pool matches. Right. So, did you qualify as like top score, or then did you get a buy straight through to the final? Um, yeah, I actually did. On the first day of qualifications, I th I think I was I was at the eighth place, and on the the second day, I I I shot a pretty pretty high score. I was uh, just behind uh, Frederick Frederick Lundmark, who shot a, an amazing score. It was at uh, I think it was. 482 he shot something like that wow that's pretty good and uh and i shot uh four what was it 470 for uh, 460 
eight or something like that. I'm not sure. But anyway, it was enough to uh, to go up to the second place. So I got got a, a, a ticket for the semifinals. Was that a relief that you didn't have to go through all of the eliminations? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty bad at uh, doing uh, matches. So... <laughs> Yeah, uh, so with, uh, with with the the target panic, it's it's quite uh, quite challenging for me. Did that so... help? Did that help then? Once you'd got that kind of you'd secured that second place, so you kind of like, well, I'm guaranteed a medal now. Does that take a little bit of the pressure off? Oh yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, when I won the 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 the, the semi finals uh, against uh, John Demmer, that that was my my biggest biggest emotion i think uh during the competition because i knew i was i was going to shoot for the finals and i would not uh go back with the chocolate medal <laughs> <laughs> were you sick of fourth place yeah three times in a row is quite a lot yeah <laughs> that's, uh, that... it can it can creep creep into your mind <laughs> yeah yeah exactly I and mean, we were laughing about it now but i, I can imagine it's that you know, like you're saying there, that you kind of hit the nail on the head, that can start to kind of get into your mind that, oh, no, is this another fourth place? <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the the thought occurs, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And once you said there was a lot of emotion there when you'd won that match, um, just talk me through that. I mean, was that was that a difficult match? I mean, is that match available on YouTube? Can this can the viewers can the listeners see that match, or is that one of the ones that's not that's not televised? Is that kind of beyond the um, the the normal kind of televisation of uh, of the world archery events? Yeah, it's it's only the finals that you can see. Right, uh, okay. semi finals they are not uh, not filmed. Okay, so what was uh, that, what was that it, like? Then? It was it was a funny match. <laughs> yeah, why? Uh, we, on the first target with uh, with John. We both shot a miss. Oh, oh dear! <laughs> so it was it was a, a very small fox, and it was really far, probably the maximum distance, the probably uh, around thirty meters. And okay. we were we were so much used to shooting big animals uh, closer that <laughs> we we both shot uh, well, we both missed by uh, by five meters at at. At, at least, <laughs> right. It was that. Was that the was that the course setters playing with you there? Because because like you were saying, they'd set all these big targets like, you know, right in your face, and then all of a sudden you've got a tiny fox at like thirty meters. Did yeah. that? Did, I mean, obviously you both missed. Did, that obviously kind of was like a bit of a. Uh oh, what's this? Oh yeah, the um, the the courses that they set up for the for the matches were <laughs> quite different. They were they were um, a lot like what what I'm used to shoot in France. But uh, for the it, it was not following the the logic of the the rest of the competition, so it was quite disturbing. Yeah, so that kind of kind of shocked you, did it? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, so we both shot a miss. That was quite funny. We we look, looked at each other and and had a, a laugh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then we we carried on to the the second target, which was uh, a black but black pen, panther panther. Yeah, that's right. Um, and it was it was a, a it was far as well, uh, at least twenty five meters, and um, so I shot I shot a ten. I got this one right. But John shot a miss again. Right. So uh, I was. It's it's always painful to see that, even if it's uh, <laughs> another archer that that does it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And does that does that um, kind of make you start thinking again? If I, I've I've just I've, as a little kind of I'm a bit of a geek and I like to analyze things. So uh, I, I had a little hunch that something in my shot wasn't quite right so i went back and i looked at literally every final that i could barebow final that i could find on youtube that they've televised like somebody's filmed it um from like 2014 onwards and I, I kind of you see the kind of interplay where somebody's thinking about what the other archers doing so even if they have a really bad shot does that kind of affect you as well as a good shot um, I 
I don't know. Yeah, uh, there, there's ob- obviously emotions involved, but you want to stay in the present moment and just leave it behind when you go on the next target. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's what I, I focus on. Uh, so it happened. I just, just focus on the next shot. Just uh, stay in the present. <laughs> and when you shoot a 10 and they shoot a miss, are you do you kind of just let that go and move on as well? Yeah, that's that's what I I aim to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just just let, leave everything behind the the good or the bad shots. And in the, and, uh, in the try try to forget about the score. Yeah. <laughs> in the finals and elimination matches, is it just one arrow or is it two arrows? It's one arrow. Just one arrow. Just, yeah. And you've during got... the qualification, it's two arrows, and then it it yeah. switches to one arrow. And then is it how many targets do you shoot at in the in the qualification or eliminations? Sorry, in the elimination rounds. Is it just? Is um, it f- so uh, the pool matches are on six targets, and then uh, at, when you you reach the semifinals, it's only four targets. Right. Okay. So just four arrows to shoot. So so a, a miss could potentially be like disastrous. Oh yeah. Usually when you shoot a miss, you know that you you lost the the match. Right. And then. But- yeah, so then uh, I was I was ten points ahead, uh, <laughs> which which got my heart pumping quite a lot. I think. <laughs> <laughs> then we, we we got to the next target it was a small, very small, small animal, but really close, uh, very easy target. But uh, I think the the nerves uh, took the the best uh, out of both of us, and we we shot an eight. Right. And then the last target. Because were, were uh, you thinking then? Uh, well, I'm ten points in front. I could win this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's there's the the shadow of the fourth place behind. <laughs> oh no! So is that is that where your kind of mind went? Is that is that a, a, a thought that just pops into your head? Do you, do you think I don't want that thought at this minute? I, I need to kind of keep my mind oh, I, empty. I, I I don't want that thought at all. But it's just just thoughts that happen. You just just have to look at them and take some distance, just uh, like like when you do meditation, you yeah. observe your thoughts passing passing through through yeah. your mind, and um, if you if you do that, you you diminish the the emotion emotional impact that they have on you. So that that's what I I try to do. You 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 were telling me that you didn't know you were sure you were doing meditation right. That's exactly right. <laughs> it sounds like you're an expert. <laughs> so so you've you've kind of got this shorter one. You've hit an eight. And then you're on your last target. Um, at what kind of points cushion did you have at that point? Uh, I was still uh, ten points ahead, so I just had to hit the target to win. Yeah. Uh, so, was that was that hard uh, I, then? Even knowing that, did that make it hard, or did that make it I easy? I was I was uh, really stressed at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I I don't remember what what animal was the target, but it was something pretty far and uh, some. Uh, a black, 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 small animal, pretty far. <laughs> right. So I just, I just knew I had to hit the target. So I told to myself that I would just aim uh, in the middle of this black, black target and just, just to be sure to hit it. So um, the 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 eleven, eleven and ten ring was uh, was really to the right of the target. So. Uh, if you sh- if you you could basically miss the target or, sh- or shoot a ten or some it was pretty close, so I did not want to take the risk. So I just uh, just aim aimed at the the middle of the target and and uh, the next thing that happened is quite funny. I j- uh, just did a terrible terrible release, <laughs> and my arrow went uh, exactly in the middle of the the eleven ring. <laughs> I that's was brilliant. not aiming there at all. <laughs> that's brilliant. That that happens. That happens though, doesn't it? And you got to kind of you, you got to take it when you get it. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that was quite a relief. And it was was quite a quite a funny way to end the the match. <laughs> so then that that that's you. You've kind of you've you've gotten rid of your chocolate medal then, and you traded up to something that's actually made of uh, made of uh, something decent, not chocolate. <laughs> um, so, what what are your emotions at that point? Then, where what do you think? Do you, have you planned for that? Have you prepared for that? Or you were you thinking, you know, we just take whatever comes? Yeah, I I, I was not planning for that. I, I just 
I just go to competitions, um, not not planning anything. I just go there and see what happens. <laughs> do you enjoy? I like, do you, I, I like the surprises. <laughs> do you enjoy the competitions as well? Is it what is it that you enjoy about going there? Um, I do enjoy competitions. But why do I enjoy that? Um, <laughs> Sorry, is that a tough I question? Just, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think I. I just, just, um, that's a difficult question. I love archery. I love shooting. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, also I love, I love to shoot in different environments and then competitions, uh, especially at that level, they, they, um, give me, uh, good opportunities to, uh, to work on self mastery. <laughs> no, that's a really so, good answer. That's it, a really it good really, answer. really puts myself in a, in an uncomfortable position, especially during, during finals like that. And it's something that, that I love. So, uh, uh, it's uncomfortable, but I love archery. So I go through it and I enjoy myself and I, I grow like that. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. And then once you've got past John Demmer, who's your next match and what, what medal is that for then? Uh, the next one was, uh, was the, for the, the finals with, uh, Freddy, Frederick Lundmark. So, uh, he was the one who beat me. Uh, three times in a row before. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, I've seen that on the on YouTube. <laughs> and at that point, are you thinking about history, about what's gone in the past, or are you kind of like, nah, I, I've already got a medal here. I'm 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 okay. What what were you thinking? What were you feeling at that point? Um, I was trying to not think about the outcome. Just uh, stay in the present moment. Uh, do my do just breathe and uh, stay stay here right now. <laughs> uh, but uh, obviously there are uh, the the thoughts of 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 the outcome. They they pop they pop in your mind and just I just I just let them pass basically. You were saying then about breathe. Do you have you got like a technique to kind of bring yourself down? Because you were saying like you got to that one target and you, and you realized you've got a 10 point lead and then what you're saying like your heart was beating is there something that you do or is there something that you've been taught or um you know is there anything that you can do to kind of bring your heart rate down and keep yourself in the present do you do like kind of box breathing or do you kind of um take a point and you just kind of stare at it or kind of you know, do you have something that that, that helps you do that? Um, usually, I, I just look at the environment. I don't. I try to not look at the at the the, the people around. I, I don't look at the the archer that is shooting with me. I don't. I don't try to look at the the targets and and stuff. I just I just stare at the the ground or the the, the trees and I I I, I breathe in the um, I guess in the the Zen way. Uh, it's um, you have a, you breathe in uh, naturally and then you exhale slowly in a controlled way, uh, more like a, um, a what is what is the, how do you call that? Uh, breathing in your in your lower belly. Oh yeah, yeah, the, not, di the not... diaphragm. Yeah, so lower yeah, down, that's like right. belly breathing, not like raising your shoulders and your rib cage. Yeah. You you don't want to to raise your shoulders even when you shoot, especially when you shoot. <laughs> yeah, and so at that point, are you thinking, well, I'm in the final now? Did that take? Did, was that pressure off you then? Do do you think you know you've not got that fourth place to to look forward to, for want of a better phrase? Um, well, I think before the the individual finals, uh, there were the the team finals as well. Okay. So uh, I knew that I already had a, a gold medal. So uh, it was just uh, going out there and uh, let let things happen and see see what comes out of it. <laughs> yeah, and um, going into the final, I mean, Frederick's a very good archer. What what? How did it go? How what was your first shot? How how did things kind of pan out? Um, so the f first target was, uh, what was it? Um, was a, a deer or something like that. And it was, was really far. It was, uh, probably at 30 meters. And, uh, I shot a low eight on this one. And Frederick shot a miss under the, under the belly of the target. 
so that puts me in a in a comfortable position for the for the rest of the match. There were there were only three arrows left to shoot, and I was eight points ahead already. Right, right. And is is that a miss? Do you, do you? I mean, you're obviously you know speculating, but is that a miss because of target panic and the pre- all the pressure, or is that a miss because of yardage estimation? Do you think? Um. I think he was he was surprised with uh, with this arrow. Uh, there was probably a bit of of uh, miscalculation and I don't know probably a bit of weak shot, but uh, I don't think it was target panic. Right, Frederick Frederick is is really strong. Is he, I think he looks he looks solid. <laughs> I was I was yeah. watching watching him on the uh, on the on the Roma Trophy the final with uh, is it Stig. Uh, or oh, is it Sven Goren? I can't. I can't remember my. I don't. My I, I, did not, I didn't follow any of that. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I was watching that, and he was he was very solid on that as well. Um, so, so now you've got um, a decent cushion. Uh, does that does that put your heart rate up or your heart rate down at that point? Did you think? Oh, it goes up. <laughs> it goes up. <laughs> goes up. Yeah. Is that answer- really, I, I really feel the the stress, the adrenaline. Yeah. I'm really, really easily stressed. Yeah, are you are you like uh, normally like either a nervous person or anxious or you know just someone who likes to get excited? Because um, I, I keep hearing constantly that you know if you want to do well in archery, you've got to be this kind of almost like a, a you know a, a, a Zen monk, and you you know you never crack a smile. You've just got to be like an automaton that you know it has has no emotions and is just super calm because i'm not like that at all i get quite <laughs> i get quite passionate and kind of excitable is it are you like that as well what's your kind of normal personality well um externally i would people would think that i don't stress at all that i'm really calm but inside it's it's uh, a real tempest <laughs> okay okay and, and and i suppose being in the final and being 10 points up see that would make me I, I, I don't know what it would make me because I've never been in that position, actually. So I'm not going to say what it would do for me. But did that, like you say, put your heart rate up? And then was that an anticipation that you thought I could win this or I've got the gold? Or was that a kind of, was it something else at that point? Well, I, I guess these thoughts, they, they happen, but I, I don't, I don't, I uh... don't. I don't follow them. I just let them pass, and uh, I just keep keep breathing. Just uh, <laughs> try to stay in the present moment and and keep going. But yeah, I was I was I was uh, in quite a comfortable position. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. even even with uh, all the stress going on. So your last arrow, um, what was your last target? Do you remember it, or was it just like did that just pass in a blur? It's actually a blur. <laughs> yeah. And was it? Do you remember if it was a good shot or anything like that, or is it just like I've I've no idea. Oh, I don't think I had really good shots during this these finals. Yeah. Well, that no shot really felt that good because there's there's this target planning going on. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's. Uh, was I guess it was an okay shot, just it hit the target. <laughs> yeah, well that's good. That's a start. <laughs> and then you've won the you've won the um the competition. Um what happens then? What you know, were you elated? Did your you know, did your teammates rush over or were you just kind of astonished? Um uh, I don't know. Um I don't get so attached to uh, to the, the result, so I was I was happy, but mostly uh, relieved that it, it I was that it was over. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And Sorry. then you go. Do you, do you have like a presentation ceremony where you go and stand on top of the podium and uh, they give you a medal and the national anthem plays? Do, is it is it that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, they do that. They do that after after each uh, after each. What was that? Um, when all the bearbows uh, finish shooting, for example, they would all go on the podium uh, uh, at the same time. Did you and, en- uh, did you enjoy that moment? Was that was that a, a good moment? Yeah, it was a good moment. <laughs> uh, 
had to sing the the national anthem yeah <laughs> did you enjoy that bit um i don't know yeah <laughs> i guess i did but it's, it's not i don't know uh, was it emotional it's not was something it... i get really attached to it's not right. something that really uh makes me emotional yeah. <laughs> So is it more the kind of the being there, the competition, the mastery, kind of overcoming problems that that kind of draws you back to doing the big competitions? Yeah, that that's that's right. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right, all right. I like I like to think that I'm not shooting for the medals, but just for 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 growth, for for self improvement, and to to keep learning. That's good. That's really refreshing. It's nice nice to hear that <laughs> because. I, I, you know, a lot of sport now, it's people kind of just do it for the rewards. Um, you see what people want and, you know, what they demand in terms of salary and stuff like that. And it's like, well, clearly you're not doing it for the game. You're doing it for other reasons, financial. Um, but it's nice to see that, especially in like a sport where, you know, it's very hard to make a living. I, I was speaking to Jake Kaminsky uh last week or the week before and he was saying look you know there's very few people can make a living at this um if that's your motivation then <laughs> you you're looking you're looking at the wrong game to be making a living um <laughs> but in terms of you know um you know development and like kind of pushing yourself i, I think for me that's the kind of ultimate goal learning about myself so it's nice to hear that at the elite level that 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 is what motivates people as well yeah <laughs> yeah um in france if you want to live off archery you have to either be a coach or owner an archery shop uh, you can't you can't be an archer and live uh, from that yeah and just i mean this has been a constant theme throughout this this podcast is the the target panic um is that something that you think you'll kind of get over or is that something you just kind of managing and it is what it is um uh, well the the way i was thinking about target panic was that um if i could uh, deal with the um, the inner issues it would well with the in, inner aspect of it i i would be able to uh, to to get rid of it uh, it's it's quite quite difficult <laughs> yeah so I, I was i was i was thinking um if uh if i do some meditation and if i if i work on my mindset and on how i see archery why on how I, why why i do archery and things like that i would i would be able to uh drop that fear that um that triggers the the target panic and just uh, be able to to shoot in the present moment without without caring about the outcome or anything. Um, but it's I think it, it it's possible, but it's it's a it's a difficult thing to achieve. Need to need to put a lot of work into it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's it's it's only through your your podcast that uh, I learned about um, the possibility of u using uh, something like a clicker, like like a, um, a psycho trigger or something like that, and uh, I've been I've been um, trying this uh, lately, but um, I still have not figured uh, completely what what will be my cue for for triggering triggering the release. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you said that when you shot with the the Olympic recurve, kind of that that kind of alleviated issues. It, it, do, you, do you hoping this is going to be the same with with a triggered shot? Because I know I was looking at Joel's online course and he added another module um, where he's where it's a non-triggered shot and it's just it's basically it's about separating the shot, um, separating the the aim. That's not the that's not the cue for the shot to kind of finish um, and making that distinction in your mind and kind of come into terms with it but i think you know if it was an easy process everyone would shoot you know tens all the time yeah what when uh, when the the aim is the cue uh, that's that's when i i get target panic so it can work sometimes but uh i often find my myself unable to to put my dot in in the in the gold <laughs> it just it just uh goes around uh in the target and j then it 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 
at some point, if everything goes right, it, it goes above the, the gold and that's when the release happens. But, but when there's a, a lot of stress, a lot of tension, then the release can happen at any time. And sometimes it's just, I can shoot misses like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, with, with something like a clicker, uh, I, I found that I can, I'm actually able to put my, my, uh, well, I I aim with the um, the needle of the arrow rest, so I can I can put my little pin in the middle and stay uh, really stable in there. <laughs> I'm actually able to do that, and uh, that's that's thanks to a, to the clicker or to a um, a triggered uh, way of shooting that I I, I discovered that. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I'm I'm. I'm doing Joel's course uh, at the minute, um, and it's going all right. It's going all right, um, especially with the kind of COVID nineteen kind of issues at the minute. I'm not getting out and shooting in the uh, in the garden that I'd like to do because there's no schools. Um, my my kids can actually go to school, but we don't want to send them there because obviously there's a chance that they'll get they'll they'll catch something from some one of the staff members or one of the other kids so mm. we're kind of we're keeping them away um because my wife's a key worker so she qualifies um so at the minute i've got two under 10s running around and uh, it's not really the best environment although my daughter is kind of learning to shoot barebow at the minute but it's just not the best environment so i'm kind of putting my time into getting my form right because i've found that when my alignment's nowhere near perfect um that is like that's a slippery slope into target panic as well so um i mean do you have good alignment good form and stuff like that is that something that you've got no no issues with i think i have a pretty consistent technique um i i worked a lot on my posture and on my form uh, thanks to shooting olympic recurve uh, for five months and um, learning to be a coach, I, I obviously l learned uh, a lot about about shooting uh, technique and posture and, and so on. So that's that's something I'm I'm really working on. It's not completely academ academic, I would say, but some sometimes you have to to adjust to uh, to your own body and uh, do what works for yourself. Cool. <laughs> so uh, in the future, we're looking at um, David Jackson. Uh, qualified coach and world champion 3d archer as well so uh <laughs> that that's that's going to be it, it do you hope to kind of coach and try and do archery for a job or is it just something you want to do for your own development as well oh it's um I, I will have a, a job at my archery club with that yeah cool so um so yeah that's that's the goal make a, a living out of archery yeah. <laughs> out <laughs> of my passion Give give your archery club a, a plug if if anyone we don't have that many listeners in France but um, maybe some people know your club give your club a a plug what are they called and whereabouts are they? Uh, it's called uh, L'Union. Uh, it's uh, near Toulouse. <laughs> oh, cool, cool, excellent. Well, all the best with the uh, coaching training and all the best with your kind of triggering of your shot and uh, we'll see what happens with the rest of the season if we uh, if we can actually get out and shoot and have some competitions and uh, at some point hopefully uh, I'll get out to meet you in person David but really great <laughs> to that. yeah yeah that'd be really cool um it's really great to have you on um you know it's obviously it's a difficult time for everyone at the minute so uh, I'm not um I'm not expecting anyone to put in you know an hour or two and come and talk to us here because every, everyone's got other things going on you know priorities other than archery but i'm really appreciate you kind of coming on to talk to us at, at this kind of difficult time thanks thanks for having me here it was a lot of fun <laughs> thanks for listening and if you're currently stuck at home and you're shooting in your back garden please stay safe until next time, see you later. Hit the egg with the Barebow Archery, Archery Podcast. Podcast. Produced and presented.
presented by Glenn Pringle for Redstone Productions Limited.